Now as we come to consider God's word together, let us pray and seek his help in understanding and applying his word to our hearts. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, the the constant refrain throughout these letters to the churches is that we would hear what the Spirit is saying to us. Lord, that is our prayer and our heartfelt desire today, that we would hear you speak to us through your word. Lord, we ask that you would grant us knowledge and understanding, that you would grant us wisdom in how we apply it, that you would grant us courage to to not only be hearers of your word, but to be doers also. Lord, as we meet virtually now in different homes and different places, would you come and speak to us that message that you have for us in your word. And bless your word to us now, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Whenever I was a wee boy in primary school, one of my favourite things was when my mum and dad would call at school around lunchtime and take me out early to go on a big adventure to Belfast. It it only happened a a couple of times a year. It wasn't a very frequent thing, but it was usually to attend one of two events, either to go to the motor show or the Ideal Home Exhibition in the King's Hall. I don't know if you can remember either of those events happening in the King's Hall or if you ever went to them, but I loved them. It was so exciting. Part of the excitement was just getting to go to Belfast and to do something exciting, but it was exciting to go to those events. And, well, to be honest, to a nine-year-old boy, the Ideal Home Exhibition wasn't the most interesting thing that I could do. But every year, in the centre of the Ideal Home Exhibition, there was a model home built in the centre of the King's Hall. The literal ideal home. It fascinated me. In the middle of the King's Hall, there was this huge show house, designed and decorated to perfection, usually with a a cinema room and a jacuzzi out the back, and lots of other really cool gadgets that we didn't have in our house. And I just remember, as a kid, being totally mesmerised by all these amazing things in this show house. And of course, this was the ideal home because no one lived in it, so it never got messy or dirty. Nothing ever seemed to be out of place. It was perfect. Maybe You've been to look around a new housing development. You've been taken to see the show house in that development. And a bit like the ideal home, this house has been designed and decorated to almost perfection. It's set out to show you what a perfect home might be like. That's the idea of show houses. It's the idea of the ideal home at the ideal home exhibition. They're supposed to give us an idea, a taste of what our home could be like. To show us something to aspire to. In some ways... The church in Philadelphia is a show church. It's the ideal church, if you like. The letter that Jesus writes to the church in Philadelphia contains no corrections, no condemnations, no calls for correction or for repentance. So the the church in Philadelphia, if you like, sets out a picture of the church that pleases Jesus. It's the kind of church that we ought to aspire to be. We do need to note at this point, I think, that it's not a perfect church. Um, no such thing exists. The Westminster Confession is very careful to remind us that even the purest churches under heaven are subject to both mixture and error. The church in Philadelphia is not perfect, but they were doing the right things. They were pleasing Jesus. And so I do think they give us a, a model to aspire to, a pattern to work to, if you like, as we seek to be the kind of church that pleases Jesus. The first thing I want us to see this morning about this ideal church, this church that pleases Jesus, is that their success rests on Jesus and not themselves. Their success, for want of a better word, rests on Jesus and not themselves. If you go onto Amazon, you can see there are lots of books about church growth strategies. There are lots of podcasts that you could listen to with helpful hints and t- helpful hints and tips about how to grow your church. There are many different courses to take about how we can experience success in the church. And all of these books, podcasts, courses basically promise the same sort of things. Ten ways to transform your church. Five things to cha- five things to change to make your church more effective. And not all those resources are bad. In fact, many have helpful insights that, wisely applied, could no doubt bring benefit and blessing to local churches. But I've noticed one common downfall often in a lot of the writing and the research around what's sometimes called church health. 
and it's that very often it's very man-centered. It focuses on structural changes, external changes that we could make, social media strategies that we could try, leadership qualities that we should em emulate to bring about maximum potential. Little tweaks that could make a difference. Uh, and sometimes in all this focus on the external, all this focus on what we can do and what man can do, we miss the fact that this is actually Jesus' church. And ultimately, all we do rests on him and the work of his spirit. Key to being the church that Jesus wants us to be is resting on him and his finished work, trusting and relying fully on him. Just look quickly down the ladder to Philadelphia and notice the language. Look at verse 8. I have placed before you. Again in verse 8. I know that. Verse 9. I will make those. Verse 10. I will also keep you. Do you see that? The major emphasis in this letter is what Jesus will do or what Jesus has done, not what Jesus wants us to do. This is also in many ways a, a core feature at the heart of the gospel, isn't it? The gospel is always more about what Jesus has done for us than what we do for him. But often we mix this up, don't we? we reverse it with a, a devastating effect. If we are to be a model church, if we are to be the church that pleases Jesus, then we need to rest and rely fully on him and his finished work. Trust more in what he has done and less in what we do. According to verses 7 and 8, it is Jesus who holds the keys and who opens doors that no one can shut. This is a powerful image of how Jesus creates gospel opportunity for us in the church. How he creates opportunities for us. We see similar language used in the book of Acts, where we're told that when Paul arrives in Antioch, he gathers the church together and reports all that God had done through them and how he opened a door of faith to the Gentiles. In 1 Corinthians 16, we're told that a great door of effective work had been opened for Paul. In 2 Corinthians 2, we're also told that when Paul went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ, he found the Lord had opened a door for him. See who opens the door? It is the Lord who opens the door. It is Jesus who opens the door. It is Jesus who opens doors and creates gospel opportunities for us. See, so often we can spend all our effort and energy trying to push doors, to create things, to do things that, that will never open. We try to dream up our own way of new and novel ideas when actually Jesus said, I will open doors for you. Instead of trying to make our own doors or push through the own doors that we would make, we need to look for the doors of gospel opportunity that Jesus has opened and is opening for us and then walk through them. You see, while we rest fully in Jesus and, and trust the success of the church into his hands, we do still have an important role to play. In his grace and his mercy, he invites us to partner with him in mission in the world. He invites us to join him in what he's doing. So he invites us to walk through those doors that he has opened for us. We have a, a part to play. But the problem is often we start doing things and then invite Jesus to join us rather than first asking the question, well, what doors has Jesus opened for us? What is he up to and how can we join him in his mission rather than trying to tag him onto our mission at the end? So let me ask you today, as you look around your life, as you look around, what doors for gospel opportunity can you see around you? What doors is God opening for you to walk to? If you can't see them at this moment, maybe pray and ask the Lord for eyes to see the gospel opportunity he has for you. And if you can't see those doors, then pray for wisdom and courage to walk through the doors of gospel opportunity that Jesus has opened for us. That's the first thing we see about this ideal church, this church that pleases Jesus. It relies on him, keeps him central in all that they say and do, not on themselves. The second thing I want us to see about this church that pleases Jesus is that they are weak. Look at verse 8. Jesus says, I know you have little strength. One commentator suggests that this probably refers to the beleaguered position of the church in Philadelphia. Small, seemingly insignificant, with an appearance perhaps of ineffectiveness in the eyes of those who look through the lens of the Roman Empire. And yet this is God's vehicle for advancing his purposes in the world. This seems completely counterintuitive to us, doesn't it? How can a church that is small and seemingly insignificant and even looks ineffective, how can that church be pleasing to Jesus? We live in a culture where big and brilliant are praiseworthy, but small and insignificant are to be ignored and to be overlooked. So how could 
weakness be a good thing? How can the fact that this church has little strength be something that pleases Jesus? How can this seemingly weak church actually be the way that God wants to advance his purposes in the world? Well, remember what Paul wrote to the church in Corinth? He tells them that Jesus says his power is made perfect in weakness. It is when we are weak that Jesus' strength can work best in us. When we know our limitations, when we are most, it is when we know our limitations that we are most likely to fully rely on him and not try to do things in our own strength. It is when we embrace our weakness that we will rely and trust fully in him. So maybe you're feeling weak today. Like you can't do anything for the Lord. Maybe you feel your strength is fading, frustration is creeping in. Take confidence. When we are weak, his strength shines through us. Notice what Jesus says to the church here in Philadelphia. He says, yes, you have little strength, but you have enough strength. Despite their limited strength, they have kept Jesus' word. They have not denied it. They might be weak, but they had enough strength to keep Jesus' word and not deny him. And often this is how Jesus works. He gives us sufficient strength for the journey. Not more than we need, but not less than we need. Just enough strength to do the work that he has entrusted to us without growing too self-sufficient. He gives us enough strength for each day, enough strength for each step that we are to take. So let's look to him daily for fresh strength to accomplish the task that he has for us. Let's look to him for fresh strength to walk through the doors that he opens for us. And let's rejoice in the fact that he works through his weak, through our weaknesses to accomplish his purposes. The third and final thing that pleases Jesus about this church is the fact that they persevere in obedience and allegiance to Jesus. In verse 8 we are told that they have kept Jesus' word and have not denied his name. And then again in verse 10 we read that this church has kept Jesus' command to endure Patient, like we thought about with the kids, they were faithful. We have encountered this language of denying Jesus' name before in previous letters, haven't we? I said then that it's likely related to Jesus' words that he would acknowledge before the Father those who would acknowledge him before men. And this appears to be the case in Philadelphia. Despite the attack and the opposition on many fronts, they have still confessed Jesus' name in the face of concerted opposition. They have not given in. They have remained faithful to him. They have not given in. They have not given up. They have faced many of the same pressures of the churches around them. uh, And yet they have remained faithful. They have stayed obedient to Jesus. They have kept their allegiance to him. They have not faltered in their faith. And this pleases Jesus. So what kind of church pleases Jesus? What's the ideal church? It's a church that rests fully and relies on him who embraces their weakness as a means of displaying his glory and strength as they persevere and obey his word in the face of trial and persecution. And to that church, Jesus makes some promises. He promises that they will be victorious. They will overcome all trials and tribulations that they face. In verse 9, we read about a very particular opposition that the church in Philadelphia faced. There were some in that city claiming to be Jews who were spreading lies about them. We don't know what those lies were. We don't know what they were spreading. But the term here, synagogue of Satan, could equally be translated as synagogue of accusation. Because Satan literally means the accuser. So this group were possibly making false allegations against the church, spreading falsehood and misinformation about them. But Jesus says that the truth will win out in the end. They will come to know that he loves the church and their accusations will not stand. But more than that, we're told they will come and fall down before them. The SV actually says that they will bow down. These are terms of worship and submission. Some commentators even suggest that these terms couldn't fear that this group who are spreading lies and misinformation about the church will one day eventually be converted and will worship Jesus alongside his church. This is the the prize for walking through the doors that Jesus has opened. This is the prize for staying faithful in the face of trials, seeing enemies become friends, seeing the lost one for Christ. It's not always easy, but in the end, it is always worth it. But not only... Will the church here be victorious in the face of the trials they face now? 
The end of verse 10, Jesus promises to keep them safe on the day of final judgment when he returns to judge the living and the dead. Those who are faithful to him now, those who keep his word now will be kept by him then. That is the promise Jesus makes to those who trust in him. It is a promise of eternal salvation and security. It's an image that's reinforced by the mention of pillars in the next verse. This church that appears to have little strength now, that appears to be weak now, will one day be safe and secure, will one day be as strong as a pillar in the dwelling place of God. This is the hope of the Christian who endures. We will know eternal safety and security with Jesus. Those who trust in Jesus now, who keep his word now, will be kept by him in the time of trial. That's the the prize for faithfulness. Finally, in verse 11, we read that we will be given new names. We will have new names written on us. Receiving names and naming things is about possession. As I read these verses this week, my mind went to how we typically prepare our kids to return to school. How we make them label their books, their stationery, their clothes, their hand sanitizer. Absolutely everything has to have their name on it so we know who it belongs to. So whenever we receive the name of Jesus, we are being identified as his possession, as his precious possession, it tells us elsewhere in the scriptures. When Jesus puts his name on us, he's saying, they belong to us. They are mine. That's the ultimate reward we receive for faithfully following him, that we belong to Jesus. He identifies us as his own. So this week, may we each aspire to be the kind of Christians that Jesus calls us to be. May we be those people who rely more on him than we do on ourselves, who walk through doors of gospel opportunity as we see them, who embrace our weakness that his strength might be shown, who endure even in the face of trials. May we be those people so that together we might be the ideal church, the church that he wants us to be, so that one day we can know that eternal safety and security of being with him and of belonging to him forever. That is our deepest desire and our sincerest prayer. Amen. Let us come and pray for ourselves and others. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we come before you today, the one who is holy and true. We give thanks for the doors of opportunity that you have opened for us. We thank you for the privilege of being able to serve you in this world by serving others. We pray that you would give us eyes to see gospel opportunities all around us in these days. Help us to see ways to both speak about and to show your love to others at this time. Father, we know that the extension of lockdown will bring difficulty for many in our church family and community, especially those who are feeling the pains of social separation and loneliness. Lord, we pray for them now in this moment. We ask that you would draw near to them, that you would comfort them, that you would help us to know best how to strengthen and support them. We lament the fact, Lord, that we are not able to be together to worship physically. We look forward to that day when this will be possible again. We give thanks for the blessings and benefits of technology that allow us to stay connected, even in limited and imperfect ways. We pray, Lord, that you would use these online services to build up and encourage our church family at this time. Lord, would you be even you pleased to use them to spread the good news of the gospel across our community at this time? Father, we do want to give thanks today for the small but significant steps on the way out of lockdown announced this week. We give thanks for the continued and the steady success of the vaccine rollout, and we ask that you would continue to bless it. We give thanks for the opportunity to meet another family in the park and Ask that this would provide an important point of social contact for many who are lonely and missing human interaction at this time. Father, we pray for those children who will return to school and ask that they would be safe and well and that they would benefit from being back in classrooms and around their peers once again. We we pray, Father, for those who will not return to school. Help them if they're disappointed. Help them to process this news if they're confused at their young age. Be with parents as they seek to balance a a new blended approach to schooling. Father, be with our teachers and school leaders as they continue to teach and support and guide our children through these difficult and uncertain days. Lord, we pray for wisdom for our government leaders as they seek to navigate the path ahead. 
Help them to see the best and the safest way to restore us to more normal patterns of life. Father, we do want to pray today as well for, for all those who mourn, for those who grieve, especially under the current restrictions. Father, we pray that they would know a special portion of your comfort at this time as they have not been able to perhaps grieve and mourn in ways that we were customary to us even just a year ago. Lord, would you draw near? Would you strengthen and support? For those who are ill in hospital, we ask that you would draw near and strengthen them, that you would give wisdom to medical staff and that you would bring peace to families who are concerned and maybe struggling to find information. Lord, draw near in those situations, we pray. Lord, we bring you these prayers, confident that you care for us, asking that you would answer according to your own good pleasure. As in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I'm going to close our service this morning as we sing the praise, O Church, Arise. Let's worship God together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all now and forevermore. Amen. Do 
Take care and God bless.